The city of Bristol straddles the state line between Tennessee and Virginia. Ernest Jennings Ford was born in this house on the Tennessee side on February 13, 1919. He came from a musical family. His parents, Clarence and Maud, and his older brother, Stanley, all sang the gospel. Ernie's first public performance came at the age of three, singing Old Rugged Cross at the Anderson Street Methodist Church. He continued singing gospel throughout his childhood, training that influenced all his music for the rest of his life. He sang songs from the churches of uh, his people. If you've ever been a gospel singer, you're always a gospel singer. And whatever else you sing, some of that comes out through there in there. Because that's what gospel does. It seeps through. Ernie grew up in the city, but his dad taught him to hunt and fish. And he spent his summers working on his relative's farm for 50 cents a day. Ernie grew up in a modest middle class existence, but he grew up in a very loving and supportive family. And I think those values came out very strongly when he became a star. In school, Ernie played trombone and performed in talent shows, but he never had any serious aspirations as a singer. After graduation, he was hired as a radio announcer at WOPI in Bristol for $10 a week. This gave him the kind of training that I'm not sure people can get anymore in radio. Everything was live. He had to be everything. He had to read the news. He had to be the master of ceremonies and host different types of shows. He was able to read commercials. He was able to deal with guests. And he was able to do that with a polish and a finesse In the fall of 1939, Ernie enrolled at the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music and received classical voice training. But he couldn't afford the tuition and soon returned to his radio career, announcing at stations in Atlanta and Knoxville. On December the 7th, 1941, Ernie was the first in Knoxville to announce the Pearl Harbor attack. He quickly enlisted in the Army Air Corps. But he ended up being a bombardier instructor in California, Georgia Air Force Base, and out of San Bernardino. And that's where he met his wife, Betty. I think it was more or less love at first sight. She was a secretary, and he went up to borrow a piece of carbon paper from her. And that started it. They were married on September the 18th, 1942, a loving partnership that would continue for 46 years. In 1945, he was preparing to ship out overseas when the war ended. He applied for work at KFXM in San Bernardino, California, and was hired once again as a radio announcer. For seven hours a day, he was Ernest Jennings Ford, a straight-laced announcer. But from 9 to 10 a.m., he became Tennessee Ernie, a crazed hillbilly DJ singing along with the records on his Bar Nothing Ranch radio show. You hillbillies born in any other month besides February. Ten years later, please sing that detour song on Friday. That's Sharon Lynn Hawkins' birthday. Happy birthday, Sharon Lynn. Move my cowbell over there. Thank you, boy. Bye. It was the darndest voice. Hillbilly. Oh. And there was no comparison. Nobody ever knew that this hillbilly from 9 to 10 in the morning was the same guy who did the news later on the station breaks that day. And suddenly, Ernie had to be creative. He had to get beyond his announcing training and draw upon his childhood. What he did was create the persona, the pea picker, Tennessee Ernie. And that really was what launched him towards the stardom that he eventually attained. He was told early on in his career by his father, Clarence Ford, my, my grandfather. He told him, never think of yourself as any bigger than the man buying the ticket to see you. And dad held to that. 
he was truly honored by how much people thought of what he did. Ernie was on a rapid rise to stardom. Helping him were Cliffy Stone and Jim Lopes, a young stage manager who worked at El Monte Legion Stadium. Together, they formed the loyal team that would guide Ernie for the rest of his career. When I first got into this business, I was frightened. I really was frightened. I didn't know, I wasn't stage fright. I was frightened if people would enjoy what I did. But I had some great people helping me in my career. And they said, hey, this, this, and this. If there were two people that knew Ernie Ford, it was those two guys. Jim Lokes, what can I say? He was dad's right-hand man. He was dad's partner. I think Cliffy, it, no, well, if it wasn't for Cliffy Stone, I don't think you'd know Ernie Ford to this day if it wasn't for Cliffy Stone. The three of them, they shocked Hollywood with their ideas and their accomplishments. In January of 1950, Ernie played the Grand Ole Opry for the first many times. Also in that month, his son Buck was born. Two years later, his second son Brian came along. Ernie's popularity continued to grow and Capitol Records felt he had the potential to cross over to more than country audiences. They teamed him with big band singers like Betty Hutton and pop stars like Kay Starr. And the hits kept coming. Bright lights and blonde haired women don't thrill me. I'm On the way home from a hunting trip in Utah, Ernie stopped in Las Vegas to see Kay Starr at the Thunderbird Hotel. The Thunderbird offered him his own engagement, but they wanted to negotiate with his manager. But Ernie didn't have one. He's driving along in a pickup truck, and he turned me and he says, he says, uh, did you ever manage anybody? And I said, no, no, but just myself. And he said, well, he said, I've never been managed, so why don't we start off even? And so we shook hands in the pickup truck, and we never had a written contract of any kind, ever. Ernie played two weeks to rave reviews at an incredible $1,750 per week. Finally, in 1951, he felt secure enough to retire from his Bar Nothing Ranch radio show. In 1953, he received the historic invitation to play the London Palladium. Things just kept getting bigger. When he went back to the, the Opry in 50, we thought, well, that's the top. She can't do anything bigger than that. And then we got this opportunity to go to the London Palladium in April of 53, two weeks, two shows a day. The first country western artist ever to play the London Palladium. People were lined up 10 deep to get in the London Palladium, every single show. National television stardom came next. He brought his pea picker character to the I Love Lucy show, appearing as her hillbilly cousin, Ernie. In the summer of 1953, he hosted the College of Musical Knowledge television show for NBC. It was a television version of the old Kay Kaiser radio show. And uh, that was very successful. Exposed him to the New York advertising community who had never really seen him before. And well, they started talking, hey, who is this guy on the West Coast? Wow, he can MC, he can sing, he looks good. This led to an NBC network daytime variety show that premiered on January 4th, 1955. This is the biggest thrill we've ever had around here with us poor folks, you know, that get up at this hour of the day and do a show, you know? Well, I've been hearing aiming so much about Tennessee Irving that I figured I'd have... Ernie! Ernie! But I really watched the show... My son he had a black and white television set in the nursery and he would uh, be in this playpen. And instead of calling the television the television set, he called it Ernie, because that's the only show that he really loved. So that was my early, early association. 
the daytime show. Ernie's schedule was intense. He was doing the daytime TV show as well as touring and doing radio. He had fallen behind on his recording commitments for Capitol Records. They were desperate for material. They considered recording a little-known 1947 folk song by another hometown jamboree regular, Merle Travis. That's weak and the back that's strong. You load 16 tons. And what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. Sixteen Tons was picked to be the B-side to the song, You Don't Have to Be a Baby to Cry. But the creative arrangement of Jack Fascinato, Ernie's conductor, and the instincts of Lee Gillette made the record special. Bones, a mind that's weak and the back that's strong. You load Jack said, uh, what, what's the tempo you want, Ernie? And he said, about like that, Jack. And Gillette said, wait a minute, keep that in, keep that snap in. And that's the snap, on the, that's Ernie snapping to show Jack the tempo. And that's how it started. I was born one morning when the sun didn't shine. I picked up my shovel and I walked to the mine. I loaded 16 tons a number nine coal. And the straw boss said, well, to bless my soul, you load 16 tons. I, I got to be honest with you. I thought it, it might be a good little record. I didn't know it was going to be this kind of a hit. I had no idea, you know? Just, you, you can't tell. Well, it was the fastest selling record ever in Capitol's history, ever. 16 Tons was released on October the 17th, 1955. In the first 11 days, it sold over 400,000 copies, and in the first eight weeks, over two million. People were analyzing its messages. I guess it was the idea that people could see in I owe my soul to the company store, I owe my soul to the finance company, to the bank, what have you. It touched an enormous chord in America. And in the process, it became an American classic. Will you load the 16 tons? What do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. In 1984, a lifetime of achievement was recognized when Ronald Reagan awarded Tennessee Ernie Ford the highest honor a civilian can receive, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Through his musical talents, warm personality, and quick down-home wit, Tennessee Ernie Ford won the hearts of the American people. Ford's music, which revealed his character and soul to all who listened, inspired as well as entertained his audiences. His respect for traditional values, his strong faith in God, and his unlimited capacity for human kindness have greatly endeared him to his fellow countrymen. America is a nation richer in spirit because of Tennessee Ernie Ford. this house, O oh Lord, we pray. Bless this house, O oh Lord, we pray. Make it safe by night and day. Make it safe by night and day. Bless these walls so firm and stout. Bless these walls so firm and stout. Keeping want and trouble out. Keeping want and trouble out. Bless the roof and chimney tall, let thy peace lie over all. Bless this door that it may prove ever open to joy and love. Bless 
Tennessee Ernie Ford has been described as a cross between Bing Crosby and the late Bob Burns. The boy from Bristol, Tennessee, started his career as a radio announcer. He studied briefly at the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music, served in the Air Force, and about five years after the war, found himself in show business, singing for a living. That was in 1950. Since then, Tennessee Ernie Ford has sold almost 10 million records, including 16 tons which sold one million copies faster than any other record in history. Now, with his radio days behind him, Ernie does a morning television show five times a week along with his weekly nighttime half-hour television program. Tennessee Ernie and Betty Ford, who were married 14 years ago, have a ranch in Northern California and recently moved into this two-story ranch house in North Hollywood. They're right next door to the Bob Hopes, whom we visited about two years ago. For the past four months, this has been home to Ernie, Betty, Buck, age seven, Brian, aged four, and Bubbles, age two. He's their English bulldog. Evening, Ernie. Oh, hello, Ed. How are you? Welcome to our home. Thank you very much. What, what are you up to there? Well, actually, this is a Father's Day present from my wife Betty and my two boys. I don't play. I, I like to play a chord or two and listen to the sound, though. I used to sing to one of these years ago. So did I. Tried to. Ernie, I've heard that you started as a hillbilly singer, and I've heard you described as a country and a western singer. Are there any big differences? Actually, yes. Uh, Ed, there are differences. You're hillbilly singers. I started that way when I first started in show business in 1950. Your hillbilly singers is, uh, uh, now we call them country artists. Uh, take in your country and, and folk singers. Your western, there is a difference. This includes your great artists like Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, Rex Allen, and great songs like Cool Water, Tumbling Tumbleweed, and those. There is a decided difference in western and country and hillbilly. However, since then, why, uh, things have changed quite a bit. Uh, does Mrs. Ford sing, too? Oh, sure, she does. <laughs> <laughs> to the kids and myself. Let's meet her, eh? Sure. This is my wife, Betty. 
do you do? Good evening, Betty. It's good to see you, Ed. Betty, I, I know that uh, you've been in your new home only about four months. Uh, you having any big problems? Oh, the main problems are the decorating and things like that. But my big problem is being without help when I have to hang out my wash. Every time I go out to hang it out, the uh, uh, tourist bus comes by, and there I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, what the bus goes by is the sightseer. They go by to see Bob Hope. He lives next door, and Betty's out there hanging out the clothes. And Well, actually, what she's doing is she does the Hope's laundry, and she's going back over there with it. Well, you two must have kept house in many places since you were married, haven't you? Sure have. <laughs> we certainly have. Any interesting ones? Oh, well, uh, Ed, yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> we have lived in, um, oh, the first place was a little ranch house out in Atlanta, California. No electricity, remember? That's right. Then we lived with my folks. This is during the war, and of course. And you forgot the chicken house. <laughs> Forgot they took the a bunch of chicken house. houses out there, and they fixed them up inside. But that was nice, they though. They were very nice. But our, our big, big deal was when we lived on the barge on the Pecos River. <laughs> well, it was a barge house tied to the bank. It used to be a floating cafe. And uh, I rented it on the Pecos River in New Mexico for $40 a month. And uh, we lived there, and I used to drive across the bridge to see if the thing was leaning so I could go turn the pump on. <laughs> we were happy there, though. We were. Well, I... the, the wonderful thing was, after we left there, we moved into a motel. And this was like heaven, <laughs> because it we were warm. It was warm and dry. <laughs> well, I gather all this was while Ernie was in the Air Force and before the children arrived. That's... That's right. And speaking of the children, Ed, they're sitting out there squirming like a worm in hot ashes. Can I go get them and bring them in here? Yeah, please do. Fine, okay. <laughs> Buck and Brian, here they come. Come on downstairs, huh? There. This is my oldest, Mr. Murrow. This is Buck, and this is Brian. How are Say you, hi, Buck? Mr. Murrow. Hi, Mr. Murrow. How are you, fellows? Buck, what's that you have in your hand there? Oh, this is part of my train. Do you have a lot of trains? Wow, well, I wouldn't say that. You wouldn't. Do you this like to have some more? First train. What's that? Do you like to have some more trains, Buck? Yeah. You want to show him what you've got? Let's go down and in here and show Mr. Murrow what, how much of your train you've got. Brian, put your shirt tail in. <laughs> there. I don't in there. <laughs> This is the first train they ever, we put this one up last Christmas, Ed, for the boys. This is the first one that they ever got. Start and we it didn't up, put Buck. up too much track or anything like that. Can you start it, Buck? Show them how to run it. Turn it wide open. Come on. Watch out. Here we go. Oh, oh, oh there goes old 97. There's old 97. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you had a wreck. Ernie. What? Yes. What, what's that car doing there in the foreground? I don't see any highways, Buck. Well, Ed, look on the front of it. I never saw one of these with Murrow on it. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I know. <laughs> Betty. My granddad always said there was a feller in Detroit that made cars and put our names on them. Uh, Betty, uh, do the boys have any of Ernie's singing talent? I, I think so. Uh, they have one song they especially like to do, uh, which is Ringo Rango. Boy, Could boy, I stand up and sing for Mr. Morrow? Ringo Rango, Ringo Rango. If I die, I ain't gonna cry. If I live, I'll get a dollar with me, a new parody, a woman to cook and wash. That's fine, boy. Fine, good. Thank, thank you very much. I talk to me. I can't send me away. I talk to many. Well, you're all right. Squat right back down there now. Uh, Buck. Yeah. Uh, who's your favorite on television? Well, especially, <coughs> I like Elvis Presley and Thomas Jeff and Tennessee Ernie Ford. And Tennessee Ernie Ford. Yeah. You really like him, do you? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Brian. What? What? What yes, show do you like? I like I like my daddy and I like my Mickey Mouse. Aha. Uh -huh.
Well, the best man that I like is Elvis Presley. Is that right? Yeah, well, that's, he's made that pretty plain. That's right. And, uh, that, that's right. I didn't hear him the first time, Ernie. <laughs> What's that? I didn't hear him the first time. <laughs> that's what he figured, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Ernie. But you like the rock and roll songs. You like the rock and roll songs? Uh, Ernie, uh, yeah, do, do the boys do much cowboying up on the ranch? They love to go up there, Ed. And <clears throat> they love to mess around with the stock and everything, and... And they love to fish. Of course, uh -huh. I love to hunt and fish. I love that better than anything. Betty, uh, do you like to hunt and fish with Ernie? Uh, no, sir. I think that at those times, especially a man should be out with other gentlemen hunting and fishing and doing what uh, other men like to do. Uh, Ernie, how does young Buck handle a rifle? He does real well. He's got his own little rifle. He keeps it locked up with my guns. And, but he, when I'm out with him, we shoot it some, and he's, he's learning real fast, uh, Ed. He's doing real fine. Are you pretty good with Spe a rifle? Speaking of hunting, I, uh, oh, being pretty good with a rifle, I, my dad learned me how to shoot. Mom, if you'll take the kids up to bed, I'd like to show Ed something in the other room in here. Uh, Ed, let's go in the den. I want to show you a couple of my trophies. Right. Good night, fellas. Say good night to Mr. Morrow. Good night. <laughs> let's go through here, uh, Ed. Uh... I do most of my uh, deer hunting up in uh, the state of Utah. <clears throat> oh, what did right you use here's... on that one? Hmm? What did you use on that one? Uh, I used a regular 30-30 saddle gun. This, I guess, is known as the gun that won the West. My oh. wife gave me this first Christmas we was married. I've had it 14 years now. Iron sights, no scope. No scope. I never uh, have learned to use a scope. My dad taught me how to shoot, and I got this feller here at about 220 yards. And uh, these are mule deer from up in, uh, mm -hmm. up in Utah. Ernie, what about those other trophies on your mantle? Well, this is a little trophy. I sponsor a young teenage football team out here in Burbank. They've been undefeated a couple of years. The Steins came from Germany, some friends of ours over there. This is a Hereford Bull uh, bronze sent to me by the uh, American Herp Association from Kansas City. I raise Herefords up on my ranch north of San Francisco. And that isn't Elvis Presley, is it? No, that <laughs> isn't Elvis Presley. No, the portrait, I mean. <laughs> no, the portrait isn't Elvis Presley. Uh, that was done by Fred Williams, who is a very wonderful young artist. He was head makeup man out here on the West Coast for another network for a while. And uh, he's now doing painting and charcoal work. I think he did a wonderful job on that picture. Very nice indeed. Ed, do you know what this is? No. That's a pepper mill. <laughs> now, that's for people that really like pepper. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it works. And the reason we've got it sitting up here, we don't know where to put it. And if you get any ideas while you're looking at it at our house, I wish you'd let us know. <laughs> I think we'll have to have a conference on that one, Ernie. And another young buck up here mm -hmm. that we got in Utah. This is a nice yearling. It's got a nice 4.7 horn. Ernie, uh, you happy in Hollywood? Yes, I am, Ed. There's things I miss in Tennessee, of course, but I've made my home here. But there are things that I was raised that, with my folks back there that I do miss, yeah. What does your family do back home? Well, I'll tell you, let's go and talk to Betty about it. You want right. to? Sure. Fine. Let's go back in the living room in here. Honey? Mr. Murrow is asking about our folks, about mine back in Tennessee, and about your... Oh, did you bring Bubbles in? <laughs> he came in. Well, all right. Bubbles, you're right in front of the microphone there, old girl. Um, my dad uh, has been in the post office in Bristol, Tennessee, for about, uh, oh, 37 years now. He's due to retire. And, and funny thing, I married into a postal family. My wife's father retired from the post office out here in California after 30 years of service. Ernie, uh, what did you do on the radio in Tennessee? I was an announcer. Do you remember any of your old commercials? <laughs> yes, I do. One in particular I'd like to tell you about. That little radio station had all the fires sold. I beg your pardon? I, I say they had the fires sold. You town. sold fires? Yes, uh, to an insurance office there. No matter what was on, music or talking, when the siren sounded, we'd cut anything we had on off of the air and say, uh, the fire is located at such and such an address. Please do not follow the fire trucks, and this is brought to you courtesy so-and-so's insurance office and read them a one-minute spot. <laughs> 
still and fires. <laughs> some weeks, some weeks we'd make little money, and other times, why it'd go a couple of months, we wouldn't have any fires. Ernie, <laughs> that, <laughs> that's true, Ed. I, I, I believe you. I believe you. <laughs> thank you very much for letting us come and visit you. And will you say good night to the boys, please? I sure will, and thank you for being so courteous. <laughs> thank you very much, indeed. Good, good night. night. Having you, Mr. Murray. Bye. Good night, Betty. Good night. We'll be back in a moment. Tennessee Ernie Ford has been described as a cross between Bing Crosby and the late Bob Burns. The boy from Bristol, Tennessee, started his career as a radio announcer. He studied briefly at the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music, served in the Air Force, and about five years after the war, found himself in show business, singing for a living. That was in 1950. Since then, Tennessee Ernie Ford has sold almost 10 million records, including 16 tons which sold one million copies faster than any other record in history. If you see me coming, better step aside. A lot of men didn't, a lot of men died. One fist of iron, the other of steel. If the right one don't get you, then the left one will. You load the 16 tons, what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me, cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. How are you, Ernie? Wonderful, Ernie. How are you, Ernie? Ernie, I'm fine, Ernie. How are you? <laughs> Uh, I, I was thinking, Ern, before what, we go any further, maybe to kind of dispel this name confusion, we ought to do something, huh? Well, I guess that's a pretty good idea, Ernie. It can get a little mixed up, you yeah, know. Yeah, Ern. Listen, what, what, what else do they call you around here? Well, there was a... <laughs> this is the biggest thrill we've ever had around here with us poor folks, you know, that get up at this hour of the day and do a show, you know? Well, I've been hearing so much about Tennessee Irving that I figured I'd... Have... Ernie! <laughs> But I really watched the show. My son he had a black and white television set in the nursery. And he would uh, be in this playpen. And instead of calling the television the television set, he called it Ernie. Because that's the only show that he really loved. So that was my early, early association. The daytime show. Should we start the next one? Oh, I don't know. I just soon stand here and hold hands and do this. <laughs> Give me a straw hat and a cane. That'll be easy to do. Let me go strolling down the lane. I doodly do. When I hear that old familiar music start, Ta -da -da. what happy memories come back to my heart. so proud you you broke one of your wires you just yeah. got so tied up in your work well that was fine and we're so glad to have you with us and you're a real stylist you're just great uh, thank you very much how's the missus she's just fine i think she's here she's here tonight we'll have some here, dinner yeah. after a while you know right. i guess you saw i brought my guitar with me I mean, <laughs> you, <laughs> you don't mind if i sing a song with you do you john <laughs> looks like it's picking time you start and leave me a little hole i'll jump in Junie, sit down on the stool there. I get stiff. Give me this. 
Well, the way we used to, remember? Okay. You like sure look pretty in your dress. Thank you. I know it. You did. <laughs> what happens during the course of an evening when a continental fellow uh, comes around to take you out? Well, Ernie, I don't think it's much different than in this country. Oh? Well, first of all, of course, he sends me a big bunch of flowers. Mm -hmm. Like about six or eight orchids. That's the way it is here. <laughs> A job. That's a phone. That's the phone. Where's the phone? Where is it? Here it is. The urgers don't act too anxious. Please remember, we've got to keep up a big front like we're doing great. Okay. okay. Starlight Towers West. <laughs> when you're smiling. When you're smiling. When you're smiling. The whole world smiles with you. When you're laughing. When you're laughing. The sun comes shining through. But when you're crying, you bring all the rain, so stop your sighing. Be happy again, keep on smiling. When you're smiling, the whole world smiles with you. I'm a rattlesnake daddy and a rattle where I please. Yes, I'm a rattlesnake daddy and a rattle where I please. And when you hear me rattle, better get down on your knees. Persons who on spoiling tater tays insist that none of them be missed. They'd none of them be missed. He's got a bundle of it, he's got a bundle of it, and another bundle of it, and none of them be missed. Captain's daughter. For a gallant captain's daughter. For the Lord who rules the water. And a tar who loves the water. Let's be there with joy belated. Ring the merry bells on board ship. Remember, this is a big, tight close-up. Hold your head perfectly still. <laughs> Action! Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hold it! Ernie, you're a host. You're too stiff. You've got to relax. Take it easy. But with a perfectly still head. Now, now, try it again. Action. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, we're going to bring you... Why did you stop? I'm waiting on you to stop stop me. So make it one for my day. One more for the road. Don't you worry about it, kid. We'll drown it in whipped cream, don't you? That long, long Might as well forget him, kid. Down the hatch. You wanted a double. Eddie! Hi. Hi. Bye, Joe.
Well, through your teeth and over your gums, look out stomach, here she comes. <laughs> Uh, pig taters. Pig taters is just the thing. I think we've got everything here to do it. Let's see. Come on. Come on. All right. Let's see. There's a bowl of taters. Yeah. And there's Salt the stuff fish. you put in. That's it. That's right. And everything. No oh, pig taters. I'll tell you, you never lapped a lip over anything like this. <laughs> We're gonna fix some too. Now let me find the good tater here. Uh, pig taters. You wash off the tater real clean. Leave the peeling on it. Now, uh oh. Have we got the two? Oh yeah, right here. There it is, right there. <laughs> Feels good again, you yeah, know, boy. Yes, yes, yes. Pig taters, you, you, you take, you've got to bore a hole through the potato long ways. Now, we use a five-eighths inch bit. We use a, we use a three-quarter inch bit at our house. You get more pig in your taters. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> you come from a smart... <laughs> you come from a smart family, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, you remember how? Yeah. Now, let's, let's, uh, here's the demonstration. It's better for two people to do this, if you can, you know. And you hold the tater real, real, real tight now. And then you kind of take it right here in the middle. And then, then you start in. <laughs> oh, maybe you better tell the girls. Oh, yeah, well, <clears throat> uh, Ernie, uh, huh? along about this time, I think I'd better tell the girls something. Yeah. While you're doing this, girls, you ought to be awful careful about getting... The, you can't get the tater too close to you. <laughs> <laughs> you're liable to get more into your work than you figured. Best I ever heard. You know, <laughs> yes, sir. Jim likes big smoke and Your Life, a program for all America. Brought to you by new Liquid Prell, the shampoo that's extra rich to leave your hair looking radiantly alive. And Crest Toothpaste with Floristan. And now here he is, Mr. This Is Your Life himself, Ralph Edwards. Thanks, Broadway. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for being with us again on This Is Your Life. Now, before we spring our surprise tonight, I want to show you a picture of a living room and a little house at 901 Windsor Avenue 
in Bristol, Tennessee. You see, there it is. Now I want you to come with me into that living room, right on our Prell stage here at the NBC studios in Burbank, California. Here we are, as you can see, it's exactly like the room in Bristol, Tennessee. And next, I want you to meet a wonderful 82-year young lady. I'm sure she won't mind my interrupting her knitting here. Hello. Hello, Mr. Edwards. My goodness, you're Mrs. Nancy Long, aren't That's you? That's right. How are you tonight? Just fine, thank That's you. That's good. You feel right at home in this room, don't you, Ms. Long? Yes, I oh. do. I know you do, because you're our principal subject's grandmother. And this is the house in which he grew up, isn't that right? That's right. Yes. Who is your grandson, Ms. Long? We'll find that out in just a moment. He regularly rehearses his television show in uh, Studio 3 here at NBC. That's right next door to our studio. Yeah. So if you'll excuse me for a moment, or two, Mrs. Long, yeah. I'll go and get your grandson. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and while I'm on my way, let's look in on the rehearsal next door. Take it away, camera number five. Okay, now let me try it. Now let me try it from back over the bench before the change is in place. Let's try now from Ernie's prime. Daily the troubadour. Hello, Ernie. Hi. <laughs> Hello, kid. Now, folks, before you say anything, be careful. This is for real tonight. Ernie Ford, Tennessee Ernie Ford, this is your life. <laughs> I gotta tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. We did this three weeks ago. We didn't get this far, but I just before I went on This Your Life, we rehearsed right across. Uh, we do the show, and, and uh, Ernie rehearses right here. I walked in. He was right in the middle, you know, with you fellas singing and all that. And uh, I said, Ernie Ford, this? And I said, oh, no, no, not you. Some other time. Tonight, this is for real. Ernie, you were a sitting duck for us to fool. <laughs> we you're, have... you're, it's, it's, you're kidding. No, this is for real. Here, you hold it and look at it if you don't believe. We didn't even have to lure you to our studio. You had to be here to rehearse tomorrow night's Ford show. And don't think that those pictures that you took all afternoon are going to go for naught. No, sir. They will appear in TV Guide. That was just a way, thanks to TV Guide, that we could get you to shave. Ralph. You see? <laughs> Claude, get a little pancake. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. I look like a sack full of doorknobs. I can't <laughs> Do you think your uh, pee-picking cast here can do without you for about a half hour? How about it, gang? Did you kid Hello, me? bud. Thanks so much, Bud York. Well, come along in, Ernie. We're going to kind of take you home, home to Bristol, Tennessee, where oh, you were brought up. Ralph. That's a long way from here, so as we travel across space and time, here, here's, here's how we get into your, our commercial. I, you know, you drive a car in on yours. Here is Bob Warren with a new twist to an old story. How did it all happen, Bob? Come on, Ernie Boy. <laughs> It was the night before Christmas, and tossing with cares was a girl who was haunted by shampoo nightmares. Nightmares of shampoos, wasteful and thin, and shampoos so cloudy, they left her hair dim. But how she longed for a shampoo that would be just right, extra rich, emerald clear, to leave her hair bright. When what down her chimney did suddenly arrive, but extra rich liquid prell to leave hair radiantly alive. She awoke to discover liquid prell did the trick for this extra rich shampoo, all praise to Saint Nick. Radiantly alive and as soft as can be, her hair shone as bright as a star on the tree. To look your radiant best, ask Santa to leave extra rich liquid prell for you Christmas Eve. This is your folks' home in Bristol, Tennessee. Does it look familiar? Well, it sure does. And look who's uh, waiting for you, as she often did when you were a boy, your Grandma Long. That's Long. Grandma Long it over there. Sure <laughs> <is> there. <laughs> oh, man alive. Oh, you know, if you look around, of course, you got Grandma there now. You're not going to well, let loose that half Nelson. <laughs> the furniture's for real, you know. Everything else in this room is for real. This here, we had a Nashville van line back up to your door there in Bristol. 
the folks th thought you were moving or something, didn't they, Grandma? Yes, sir. Yeah, they began talking, but it was to bring all the curtains, the drapes, the books, magazines, pictures, everything. There's, there's my piano. brother's picture. Yeah, and here's your old... And there's the clock my dad bought from Miss Christie. That's right. Where's Ernie's mother, Ms. Long? Mild. Mild. Ernie's home. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> Tell you, we plot this thing. We think he may move here. He moves over there. We just what don't know. What have you done? What have you got here? on that. Dad says they use a little prell on that mustache up there. You haven't seen him with his mustache. No, I didn't. Don't know you. Uh, Dad, how about uh, Stan, Ernie's older brother, Mr. Ford? Well, he couldn't make it tonight, Ernie, but he sends you his best wish. Yeah. Stan is not here. Yeah, he's, he's watching here. right now, right out there, and he sends his very well, best there. I Come on, let's sit down. Do. Ernie, you sit by Grandma here. All right. And Mr. Ford, you join in. Kind of reminisce about Ernie's early days here in Bristol, Tennessee. Ralph? <laughs> Ernie, I can't begin to tell you that this, I don't want to live through a day like this again in my life. With your rehearsing next door, scheduled to come in, we had guards all over the place. We had all your gang. They knew about it, see? Trying to play it real, this was tough. Did you know? Ralph, I'll tell you, I haven't had a bath today. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. let's look through back through the book, and maybe we can find out how you came to be tall hog at the trough, as you would say, Ernie. Um, this is your life, Tennessee Ernie Ford. When did you come out? Oh, we got here. <laughs> How'd you like? A oh. hill far away stood an old rugged cross. You listen, Ernie? That's a hymn from your latest recording for Capitol Records. Grandma's singing along here with you. When did Ernie first learn to sing Old Rugged Cross, uh, Ms. Long? Well, he wasn't quite three years old when he sang at the church conference. Three verses through without being prompted. <laughs> Bravo for you there, boy. That would be in 1922, Grandma, right? Yeah, that's right. I'll bet you were hotter than a bucket of red ants. <laughs> <laughs> it was when Ernie was about six or seven, about 1926, wasn't it, Mrs. Ford, that he brought home a little four-year-old boy. Yes, I remember that story very well, Mr. Edwards. Ernest, you remember you came in the house one day leading a little boy, and you said, Mother, this is Emmett Carter. And his father's dead, and his mother is, uh, has to work for a living, and she doesn't have time to rock Emmett to sleep. And you said, uh, I told him that my mother would be glad to have uh, a little boy sit on her lap. And uh, he said, you will, won't you, Mama? You'll rock Emmett to sleep, won't you? And yeah. said his little heart hurts because his mother can't rock him to sleep. I don't remember. I don't know if you know it, but that little boy whom uh, you got your mother to comfort Ernie, uh, when he was four, was killed in action in World War II. The neighbors there on Windsor Avenue remember you as an industrious little fella, always looking for odd jobs to make some extra spending money. Hello, anybody home here? Well, whose voice is that, Ernie? They're gonna start dropping in. You better start remembering. That's a girl who lived in your block back in 1928. You used to call her your sweetheart. You haven't seen her in, oh, 15 years or more. So come on in, Mary Bray. Mary Bray! Now Mrs. No. M.T. Smiley of Lynchburg, Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> Ernie, she's, uh, she's Mrs. Smiley of Lynchburg, Virginia now. Almost like old times, isn't it, Mary? Her Ernie... mother turned the best buttermilk of any <laughs> Ernie here was kind of sweet on Mary? you, wasn't he? Oh, Ernest, you were, had a real crush on me. I sure <laughs> did. <laughs> You were, and I was a, quite a young lady in my early teens, and you were a little boy of about nine. <laughs> and I used to walk down the railroad track with a syrup bucket going down to your house to get buttermilk. How <laughs> did Ernie show his young affection for you, Mary? Well, he uh, used to walk me to school and buy me presents like uh, tins and store cologne. <laughs> and I bought a bottle I bet was a quart and a half for 49 <laughs> 
<laughs> it was good, though. Yeah, and, and Mary, I... used, Mary used to walk back from school with me along the creek bank, too. I remember that. <laughs> well, we're not going to tell everything. Just to... <laughs> I remember I'll one Christmas never... that you bought me a beautiful mirror. It was about this high and about this wide. And in the top of the mirror was a picture of a rose-covered cottage. Uh, that's how you spent that extra money you earned, Ernie, yeah, when you were I, nine. I, I remember. Mrs. Ford, weren't you going to fix something special for Ernie? Oh, my goodness, yes. His very favorite applesauce cake. I'll help, too, Mrs. You Ford. Come on, Did See you come on, Grandma. See you later, Ernie. Yeah. All right, Mary. All right. There Ralph, we go. I'll tell you. <laughs> Grandma, <laughs> you're still good and peart, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Dad, you come on back and reminisce with us, Mr. Ford. We know that... Uh, we know that you started singing at an early age, very early age, Ernie, but yeah. you studied a couple of instruments, too, didn't you? What were they? Well, and I remember my folks arranged for me to take violin lessons uh, at home when I was a little kid in school, and my dad played the fiddle. There's a difference in fiddle and violin. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and the trombone, He too. taught me to play the fiddle, and then I played the violin. I, I took up trombone. In high school. Well, uh, you played in the grade school and high school bands. Yeah. And every uh -huh. Sunday you sang in the choir at the Anderson Street Methodist Church in That's Bristol. An old church home. Mm -hmm. Ernie had a fine voice, and Ernie showed the promise of being a great singer. Now, can you tell us who this visitor is, Ernie? She said she, you might not just quite recognize her. She was your childhood Sunday school teacher 30 years ago. You know her as... 30... Man, Man can... Miss Man! You no. call her. You haven't seen her in almost 15 years. Here My from Washington, D.C. is Mrs. Claude McQuillan. I wasn't any bigger than... Just the size of your boy. Bernie was pretty active in church, Man. wasn't he, Ms. McQuillan? Very active. He always took part on our holiday programs, and at Christmas he rode around in the truck with the other children. We used to Christmas go sing time. at Christmas time, didn't we? And put, yeah. Oh, yeah. man. When, when Ernie was 15, let's see, that'd be about 1934, he sang a solo in church, didn't yes. he, Miss Nan? No longer lonesome, a beautiful old lamb. That's right. And someone in the church said, Nelson Eddy has nothing on our Ernest. Yeah, and that made you think that Ernie had Bless real talent. Heart, <laughs> didn't yeah. it, Mr. Ford? Yeah. Yeah. Then we began to uh, give him voice lessons seriously. Classical music, you know. Yes. Ernie uh, wrote his high school senior class song, didn't he, Mr. Ford? Yes, he and Charlie Oakley. I remember one night they were practicing the thing and the curtain caught a fire. And <laughs> Ernest climbed up in the top of the audience. Pull that curtain down, down and Ernest nearly caught fire that <laughs> night, I'll tell you. <laughs> he saved the school. He saved the school. I'm told uh, uh, about that, that that didn't make you too popular with the rest of the student body. Not you know, too much. I didn't burn out too much of the school. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mrs. Claude McQuillan, Miss Nan, and Dad, Mr. Tom Ford. You'll see the scallywag later here. He's a little too heavy. For my size, honey, for my size, I'm going on the mountain, going to see my later, baby. Ernie, that promising young voice of yours was to win the hearts of America. But before that, you were to give up your singing career and spend some pretty lean years. You were poor as Job's turkey, as you'd say. Sure was. We'll learn all about that in just a moment. Right now, let's look in on this beautiful young girl. Hello, I'm Joanne Jordan, and this is New Lilt Home Permanent with Squeeze Bottle Magic. Its magic new squeeze bottle makes New Lilt the fastest, the easiest home permanent ever. Here, let me prove it to you. With any other leading home permanent, it's dip, dab, down, up, again and again. With New Lilt, it's so much faster and easier. Just squeeze, it's a breeze. And what about the saturation you need for longer lasting curls? This other leading home permanent didn't even saturate these curls made of blotting paper. As for Lilt, it saturates instantly, more evenly and thoroughly. It's this perfect saturation with Lilt that gives you lovelier curls that last and last and last till you cut them off. Isn't it wonderful? A squeeze easy way to curls that last till cut. Get new Lilt home permanent. Thank you very much, Joanne Jordan. Well, we're ready to pick up where we left off. Are you ready to go on, Ernie? Well, I'm as ready as I'll ever be, Ralph. Quicker I've than a, quicker, what'd you say, quicker than a gar... The, as quick as a gar can skin a minute, is yeah. that what you're trying to talk about? Yeah, we're back in Bristol, Tennessee. This is your life, Tennessee Ernie Ford. 
Who's gonna shoe your pretty little feet? Who's gonna glove your hand? 1937 now, Ernie, you graduate from high school. Sure that you want to follow a serious singing career. How did you finance your vocal studies, Ernie? Ralph, I worked a little while, saved a little bit of money, and I went to a big school up in Ohio for a little while, and I run out of money. And First my... you had an announcer's job, though, at, right yeah, there in I, Bristol. I at, worked uh, as an announcer there in Bristol. and W-O-P-I. Yeah, W-O-P-I. At 29 and a half cents an hour. That's right, about that. 1750 a week. 1750 a week, and I tried to save a little money, and I went to school and yeah. run out of money, and my folks were kind of hard-pressed. First of all, you were living at home, and as you say, this, there's the Cincinnati Conservatory that you went to, That's eh? right. Nice. And uh, that was about two years later, in 1939. Uh, did you have a job there while you were studying? Or no, I, well, in a way, I went there to study, and I had three voice lessons a week. I paid for one of them by singing in my instructor's church choir to pay for one lesson, Mr. Professor Hubert Cockress, and I sent my dirty clothes home and Mama washed them and mailed them to me. <laughs> I saved that much. And at the end of a year, you run out of money, leave the conservatory, and resolutely turn your back on a singing career. I had to. <laughs> 1940, you return to your radio announcing job at WOPI in Bristol with, right. with a raise, uh -huh. followed by similar stints at WATL in Atlanta and the NBC station in Knoxville, WROL. That's right. And then... Oh, Ralph. Yes, 1941. You enlist in the Army Air Corps and are assigned to the cadet school. Yeah. I met Ernie at the Victorville Air Force Base in California where I was a civilian secretary and he was finishing his cadet flight training. Yep, Ernie, the lovely girl from San Bernardino, Betty Bless Hemminger. Her. Now, Mrs. Ernest Ford, here's Betty. <laughs> Oh, be good to her. She's had such a lot on her shoulders for oh weeks. She's had to keep it. Sit down, please, Betty, Jeez, over there. And uh, cold, tell, us, right. tell us about your courtship. Well, it was pretty hectic, uh, Ralph. Oh. We had uh, four dates. He never kept a How one long of have them. you known about that? <laughs> well, we never got to keep one date because he was confined to the base for committing slight infringements of rules or something like that. You do. I think the first time I ever met her and went in there, I. Ask her to borrow some carbon paper. And uh, first date we ever had, I bought a dozen roast nears and took them by her house, and I didn't get to eat a one of them. <laughs> Did Ernie bring you any presents, Betty? Oh, yes. Uh, his big courtship present was a piece of his applesauce cake that his mother had sent him. Well, <laughs> you were a giver, weren't you? Then? <laughs> Two months later, on September 18, 1942, you're married. Gaily the troubadour touched his guitar. Look at those old pictures. When he <laughs> was hastening home from the war. 1943, you're commissioned a second lieutenant, Ernie, and are assigned as a bombardier instructor there in Victorville. Where did you two first live after your marriage, Betty? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Chicken houses. <laughs> a converted chicken coop, wasn't it? We did. Like we that? lived in a converted chicken coop in Victorville at the feller. You remember that? Oh, yeah. You weren't exactly eating high on the hog there. She <laughs> cooked a big dinner one night for company, and it rained, and the rain come down the flue and put the fire out in the stove. <laughs> the chicken is about half done. <laughs> then you're transferred to the Carlsbad Army Airfield in New Mexico. That's right. There, Betty and Ernie lived in an old ramshackled houseboat on the Pecos River. Tell us who that is, Ernie. That's Chuck Dermott! He was base adjutant of the field no! major Charles L. Dermott, now with Management Methods Magazine, no! New York. Here's <laughs> Betty and Ernie on there. Come on over here, buddy. So Visit you as he lived with it. <laughs> <laughs> you visited with him there on the houseboat, didn't you? Yes, that's, uh, that was quite a novel experience, Ralph. Uh, oh, uh, whenever they entertained uh, company, they had to seat everybody strategically on the boat to avoid the lilt. You know? yeah. And I'd come home, remember, I'd cross the bridge on the Pecos River, and I'd look down, I'd slow down, 
And if the old house was leaning, I'd have to go down there and turn the pump on. And pump the <laughs> off duty days pumping, pumping out that boat. <laughs> well, they were lucky to get any house during those days, oh, yes. weren't there? That's right. Well, on a river you. or not. And that's a far cry mm -hmm. from that ranch you have now up above San Francisco, yeah. Ernie. Thank you, Dude. Mr. Charles oh, Dermott of New York. Boy. You'll oh. see <laughs> Your first big recording hit. But the road to that success was far from easy. 1945, just as you're about to be shipped overseas as a bombardier, the war comes to an end. And you and Betty decide to go to Alaska. What were you going to do there, Ernie? Well, Uncle Sam was giving away uh, farming claims and timber claims. And uh, I was still at that point in my life where anything for nothing, I was pretty ready to take it. Uh, <laughs> We were going up there and settle and work one of those for four or five years, homestead and then we could time, homestead huh? it. And uh, to finance this project, you take an announcing job at KFXM in San Bernardino, That's California, right. and Alaska is about to lose a couple of homesteaders. Yeah. 1947. The owner of KXLA, Loyal King in Pasadena, gives you a job. In the morning, you're Tennessee Ernie, using a kind of hillbilly voice as a disc jockey on <laughs> on what program? They're looking at a picture of. Oh, Ralph. <laughs> What was the name of that program, Bar Nothing? Bar Nothing Ranch. And at noon, your announcer, Ernie Ford, using your own voice, doing the news. Nobody connects the two. Even after he won fame as Tennessee Ernie, very few people knew that his last name was Ford. A man who's been very important in your career, Ernie. Most friend. famous entrepreneur of country and western entertainers, your good friend, Cliffy, Cliffy Stone. Stone. Oh, right. You dog. <laughs> I know that you and Ernie are just like this, Cliffy, both That's in right, business right. and friends. Uh, come on over here. How did you two first get together, Cliffy? Well, I first met Ernie at KXLA in Pasadena in 1947. That's right. And uh, he used to come in on our noon hometown jamboree radio show, and Ernie would sing bass with our quartet. And he was a good one, too. Yeah, for nothing, of course. Oh, naturally, for <laughs> nothing, right? Yeah, Remember? That sure did. And he did so well as a bass singer, we thought we'd try him out as a soloist. Yeah. On Saturday night at our dances, Ernie would get up and just kill the people. And uh, You and Betty have known this all the time. <laughs> uh, don't look at me like that with those eyes. I can't stand it. There'll be hours of explaining. He did a sort of a bashful... That's right. Ernie played the bashful oh. hillbilly. <laughs> You had dreamed of as a boy, but songs close to the hearts of all of us. Come on, sit down here with me. Some people say a man is made out of mud. A man's made out of muscle and blood. I'd like to use one of your colorful expressions again, Ernie. That's too wet to plow, <laughs> which means it's just great. That's the record. It set a record up to that time, 16 tons, sold over a million records in 21 days. In a year, it's top 4 million, if you please. Cliffy Stone here helps set your feet on the path that reaches all of us in you, Tennessee Ernie yeah, Ford. Cliff. We hear America singing. England, too, and all over the world. Ernie's top hog in Vienna right now. He's the top, the top, top hog in, in, in Vienna. Can he say something? Ernie, else? he's here. The Is young, that Pete? The fellow who wrote you your first fan a letter from overseas. He was there when you wowed him at London's famous Palladium in 1953. Pete! Brought him here from his home in... Pete! You what for heart? Oh, oh, oh. Pete, bring him over here, boy. Bring him Pete, on over here. You're getting fat, Pete! <laughs> Aren't we all? You, uh, <laughs> we brought uh, Peter Osden all the way. First letter I ever got from a foreign country. That's right, from uh, Watford Hearts there in uh, in England. Uh, Ernie did all right at the London he, Palladium, didn't he, Peter? Oh, he certainly did. I was there every night for two weeks. He talks like a hillbilly, don't he? <laughs> <laughs> I remember, first time I appeared at the Palladium, and that's right. And when I nearly had kittens. I Remember? sure did, Pete, and you were the, you, you came over to meet me, it was like meeting an old friend after corresponding mm -hmm. for three years. Uh -huh. He needn't have worried, though, eh? Oh, of course not. He's loved in America just like he is over here in, he's loved in just like he is in America. <laughs> you Sorry, have. Fell down. You did not. You just look great, honestly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Peter Osden of oh, Watford man. Hearts, England. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
What's this? Getting started, no. your applesauce cake. Applesauce oh. cake. Mom really baked that That's the best in today. the world. And I'll look who's it. here to help you eat it, Ernie. You're two young with Buck Hi. Eight Seven and Ryan Moore. The two boys, Buck Seven, Ryan Moore. This is your life, Tennessee Ernie Ford, the boy who loved music and grew up to give all of us the music we love, the songs of our churches and the songs of our forefathers. There you go, Tennessee Ernie Ford. In just a moment, we're going to take a look into Ernie's future here on This Is Your Life, but first, here's Bob Warren. Thank you, Ralph. Do you know that right at this very moment, it's three to one that you've got soft spots in your teeth? Well, it's true. And those weak areas are where cavities usually start. But it's not too late to do something about it, as millions of American families have already discovered, because Crest toothpaste actually stops soft spots from turning into cavities, something no other kind of toothpaste can do. Watch. Cavities often begin with tiny soft spots that regular toothpaste pass by. Crest hardens those soft spots, stops soft spots from turning into cavities. At the same time, Crest strengthens the entire tooth against decay. That's because of Crest's own special fluoride called Fluoristan. And flavor, Crest tastes wonderful, sweetens your breath and brightens your teeth. So start your family brushing regularly with Crest, the toothpaste that stops soft spots from turning into cavities. Thank you very much, Bob Warren. Thank you. Well, Ernie, let's take a look into your immediate future. Uh, Frell will have a party in your honor right after the show. Boy, what a time that's going to be here <laughs> with Peter and all the guys. <laughs> At the beautiful Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel in Hollywood, where your family and friends from out of town have been staying. First of all, for Betty, Frell has this beautiful oh, Marshall custom-designed gold charm bracelet. Take a look. Each oh, charm symbolic of one beautiful. of the many uh, memorable events oh, in good. your life. That's As for you, good. Ern, Marshall uh, has created, where are they? Oh, my, I want to see these. Uh, handsome portrait in crystal cufflinks. Oh, you're see, showing them over there. Uh, with a likeness of your son Buck in one and your son Brian oh, in the oh, other. Well, in addition, you, we'll see to it that you receive a complete film of tonight's program oh, along yeah. with a 16 millimeter Bell and Howell camera and motion picture sound projector so that you can look back on this half hour whenever you wish to. Now, Ernie, being such a great singer yourself, we know how much you enjoy good music. So, Prell would like to present you with this magnificent Magnavox, world leader in high-fidelity television, as well as an AM, FM, radio, and record changer with high-fidelity remote speaker for the new house. Finally, we know that you just bought a ranch a little over a year ago, and one day you hope to be the proud owner of a fine herd of Hereford cattle. Is that yes. right, Ernie? Yes, sir. Well, we'd like to help hasten that day with this one-year-old prize heifer from the famous Corona Hereford Ranch. Tennessee Ernie Ford to oh. over 40, uh, 50 million people each week. You're a touch of home, a touch of all the grassroots qualities that go to make up the heart and soul of America. But most important of all, you're always you, Tennessee Ernie Ford. Thank you, Ralph. From Bristol, Tennessee. Thank you. This is your life. Good night and God bless you. Thank you, Ralph. Our guests were flown here by TWA, Trail of Airlines. We now fly the newest and most luxurious airplanes in the sky. Fly the finest, fly TWA Super G Constellation. Be sure to be with us next week when you'll see a story that... This is Your Life has been presented by Crest Toothpaste with Floristan and by new Liquid Prell, the shampoo that's extra rich to leave your hair looking radiantly alive.